scientifically based. It's, um, it's just complete BS. And so we were able to show that through the judicial process and the jury eventually agreed with us that these were misrepresentations, this violation of consumer fraud. They were also saying that they're effective in treating homosexuality and they can actually change you from gay to straight. And there was a lot of discussion about what that meant and you know, they tried to backpedal eventually of saying, well, you know, when we mean um, change, what we actually mean is changing your label. And so, you know, you just like call yourself heterosexual and then poof, you're heterosexual. See, that's pretty easy, right? <laughs> and so they would say that and they say, well, and then maybe for some people it's, um, it is label identity plus behavior. And you know, people can probably you know, modify their behavior to some extent. I did as a Mormon for a long time, but that's like a whole different story. It's a whole different story to say, you know, we're gonna help you, um, you know, not have gay sex or like, you know, help you to have a more healthy sexuality in accordance with, with what you conceive of that as meaning versus we're gonna change your sexual orientation. And we did find a lot of misrepresentations that said that that meant, um, that meant your actual attractions, that meant exact how you feel, that means who you're attracted to in a very fulsome sense. And that was a misrepresentation as well. Are there any other questions at this point? <coughs> you know, one of the things that we, yeah, I please. Mm -hmm. We do have some reports of transgender individuals falling into these sorts of programs, but it's much more anecdotal as far as I'm concerned, uh, as far as I'm aware. And the reason for that is like these are kind of boys clubs, you know, I mean, and like even for, um, it's, it's about like people who are, they profess to have changed themselves, they're, they're men. Um, men identif uh, male identified people, and, um, and they are spending their professions, their time, their um, energies of spending time with other people who are also attracted to men. And, um, and one of the things I'm talking about next is these weekends in the woods that they do together. And it's very much like doing all sorts of gay, well, I mean, gay is too much of a dignified word for it, but it's like it, they're doing all of these like homoerotic things and they're changing out the words. And so, for example, <laughs> for example, <laughs> um, one of the things that they love to do is um, quote unquote healthy touch. And so you go to these weekends in the woods, it's all guys who are attracted to guys, a, a variety of different ages, some very young people. And so one of the evenings they do is they turn down the lights, they have some soft music playing, and you pick a partner. And so the partner you pick is supposed to be one of the counselors or one of the people that's in charge or one of the volunteers who has what's called um, golden father energy. And so you identify, <laughs> <laughs> serious, I'm totally serious. Golden father energy. And so you identify this because one of the reasons you're attracted to men, of course, is because your father didn't give you the love you needed as a kid. And so this is your opportunity. You finally get to get all that, you know, golden father loving. And, um, and so they will have different, um, different kind of formations that you can like be cuddling with another man, sometimes for the younger ones, like Haim was there, 18, it was his first time in a community of people other than Orthodox Jews, and he was completely knocked off guard. You know, you, you get there and there's people in sunglasses and black trench coats, and they're saying, what does it mean to be a man? And, you know, these weird things, yeah. Totally. One of our, um, one of our, well, we had some really amazing experts. Um, one of them was a recent past president of the American Psychiatric, American um, Psych Psychiatric Association. And, um, and also one, Lee Beckstead, is from the American uh, Psychological Association, who was on the task force that investigated and the, really evaluated the research in this area. And another one that really goes more to your point, she's an expert on cults and crazy therapies. And what she was doing is we didn't go so far as say that Jonah and people can change as a cult, um, but what we did say was that they were cult-like. And so she had these ideas, she came up with these, um, this research, social science research about cults and about, um, about uh, what's the right word for it? It's um, 
It's when you're influencing someone and not really giving, like it's, you're sort of maybe giving, like you're saying that they have a choice in the matter, but because of the way they set it all up, you don't really have a choice. And you get there, you're like, they, you don't get that much time to sleep, you're in a very um, uh, unfamiliar environment, they take away your cell phones, you don't have any contact with the outside world, um, you know, you're... Do they I know that there was testimony in his heart, because it was a month-long testimony, but there was testimony to the effect that, um, that what they are doing is horrendous, that it's against any sort of accepted practices, and certainly that aspect of the, um, sex, as you say, a sexual sort of predatory aspect was certainly present in the testimony. So I think that got across to the jury. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, let me keep going just a little bit. Um, and to go to your point more, this is some of the testimony that came out. Um, you know, the Journey into Manhood program, the Weekend in the Woods that I was talking about, was just the first part of it. There's another part called Journey Beyond. And it's something that I'd like to become kind of more well known because, you know, when you hear from some people, oh yeah, you hear about conversion therapy and it sounds at least some people can try to make it sound relatively benign, but you know, kind of what's at the end of all these steps? And we found out. <laughs> it's a, well, at least part of it is this program called Journey Beyond, and it's put on by an organization called People Can Change. And I should go ahead and, and mention now, since our time's gonna be wrapping up relatively soon, that People Can Change is the subject of a recent complaint to the United States Federal Trade Commission um, based on uh, a consumer fraud sort of a theory. And it's also, the complaint is against uh, the industry overall, but especially against People Can Change. And again, that one is um, spearheaded by the National Center for Lesbian Rights, um, us at the Southern Poverty Law Center and Human Rights Campaign. And, um, and what we're really asking the federal government to do is to investigate the industry and, to, and people can change in particular and to help you know, end the practice nationwide um, by calling it for what it is, a type of, um, of fraud on consumers. Journey Beyond, as I mentioned, is the super secret <coughs> program that they make people basically swear to secrecy to go. And we had a whole bunch of quote unquote success story witnesses because that was one of their strategies on the other side is like, look, we're gonna bring all these dozens of witnesses and they're gonna say this was the best thing ever and it helped them become heterosexual and now they love, um, you know, they love being with their wives and like everything is wonderful all because of us. And so, um, so they trotted out, I think 17 success story witnesses like around the country, including Canada. Um, and Jonathan was from um, Israel, he is in Israel. And Jonathan was their, um, their star witness. <laughs> and you know, I actually don't dislike any of them. I find, I find some of them like really sad. I find some of them to be like liars because the ones that are having the tallest tales are ones that are actually doing this work and they're making money from it in some way. Um, but Jonathan was their star witness. And like actually I kind of feel, I mean I feel bad for a lot of them. I feel bad for Jonathan. I don't dislike Jonathan. But Jonathan is kind of perpetuating this whole thing because now he's doing similar counseling as Alan Downing in Israel. And we had, Jan I was deposing Jonathan in New York in, um, before the, the trial happened. And we got to Journey Beyond as we did with other success story witnesses. And he said, no, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna talk about that. And we had fights with lawyers for people can change over this, even though they weren't a defendant. So it was very interesting. The way that we designed the case is that people can change wasn't a defendant in the case, but their program was on trial because it was a part of Jonah's program. Jonah, one of the first things they say, you come, oh, you have to go to this weekend. You'll have like months and months worth of progress. You'll never get any other way. And then all of the Jonah people would show up, including Alan Downing, to the journey, you know, the people can change weekends in the woods. And it's all kind of mixed together as part of the program. And so we were able to bring in evidence about Journey Beyond and, journey, and the Weekends in the Woods because um, the successory witnesses were saying, oh yeah, this was great. And so what happens is that um, in Journey Beyond, um, you, know, you get there and you start um, going through this rebirthing process and you're, every, everyone's naked, including the many um, people who've been through it before that come to witness this. They're standing around the, in the, the circle and then the new initiates, they're naked and they're put in kind of swaddling blankets and they're, um, they, go, they start at that 
level of a rebirthing kind of situation of starting at the very beginning. And then the Journey Beyond program goes through step by step this journey into um, manhood in their conception where you start as a young boy. And of course it's all naked, everyone's naked. <laughs> and um, through much of this pro these process for, many, for a number of days, it's like three or four or five days, more than four, four or five days. And so um, as, as young boys and um, in part of the process, you're out there naked with, other, with everybody else, throwing mud on each other, cake on each other. You're you know, just frolicking around, looking for frogs, you know, whatever. You're just acting like a little kid. And then, you know, of course, after all of the mud, then everyone has to go to the showers together. And you know, these are people, this is you know, to become heterosexual. And they're all like, <laughs> you know, they're all like in the showers, naked. And like we have specific testimony that, um, that they're helping wash the mud off each other's backs, you know, these sorts of things. And it's like, it's very sensual. It's very like homoerotic. And, um, and then like you get a little bit older and, um, and there's a scene where you're, you're completely naked, you're standing in the woods, you're blindfolded. Um, the people who are there helping you, sorry, if this is, it's a lot to take, isn't it? The people that are there helping you, they're like, they're like helping you feel sensations. And so you're like, you're there with a blindfold and like they're feeding you grapes. So you can like really, you know, enjoy that sensation of like, you know, the, the taste and like the feel of the wind on your naked body. And like, um, and you know, like really like, and so this is all like helping the people to like become heterosexual. It's like, it's outrageous and it goes on and on through the four days until, um, you know, they've journeyed beyond. Um, and, and, and so Jonathan was the one that gave us that testimony after we called the lawyer on the phone, and um, just a second, and we made the argument why this testimony was necessary to our case and that we were entitled to it because he and others had just testified on the record that Journey Beyond was a big aspect of their quote unquote change, and so we need to know what it is. And so he told us, <laughs> and, then, um, and then eventually came out in trial testimony and was made public. Mm -hmm. No, that's a, great, that's a great question. And I think we are just about out of time, actually. <clears throat> and so um, really briefly on that, and then I think we'll wrap up unless there's some other questions. Um, it was fascinating. The, the judge, he brought in, um, I think it was like 500, five, 600 people as potential jurors. And there was this whole process of kind of like sifting down. And so beforehand, both sides had agreed to different questions. And what it really boiled down to was they wanted to find people that were as anti-gay and like anti-gay religious as possible. And like we would love to find people that you know said, oh yeah, like my best friends are LGBT and like I'm totally fine. I think this kind of stuff is crazy. And so what happened was very fascinating. One thing that was fascinating about it was how many people got dismissed because they had anti-LGBT views. And they said essentially, that they would not be able to sit and listen to the evidence fairly because they had bias against LGBT. They admitted that. And you know, yes, some people want to get out of jury duty and I'll say anything to get out of it. And hopefully some of that's the reason for some of it. But it was shocking to me to see that much anti-LGBT bias in New Jersey, Jersey City, right across from New York City. And it shows how much work we have yet to do. What it ended up being was the people that were pretty, <clears throat> pretty, um, neutral <laughs> and so they really didn't have strong feel or at least they didn't portray feelings one way or the other they were really kind of like didn't seem to have an opinion about much of anything and i was really kind of worried because you know like if they don't have an opinion about this like what sort of person are you you should like know right away that like this is wrong but those were the ones that um that were selected to be jurors and it was amazing by the end of the case when they read the verdict um, it was unanimous in our favor and the other side, they asked for the jury to like individually, um, basically poll the jury to individually say their verdict on the different counts. And, um, and they were adamant. I mean, they were so mad by the time the case was over and they were so sure that, um, that what the defendants had done was horrendous and had violated the law that you know, in their voice they were saying, you know, yes, 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 for the, for the verdict that um, you know, whether they had violated each of the provisions of the Consumer Fraud Act. So it was an amazing day to be there with our clients, to um, have won the first case that put conversion therapy on trial, 
and to um, you know really be a part of this historic movement that continues with our allies and others to see the end of conversion therapy. And really from the very beginning, from Wayne Besson out there being one of the only voices against conversion therapy to now where it's become an international movement. You know, we have similar work being done in other countries. We have laws being passed in um, a variety of different states and introduced in others. And now we have the federal government and the United States president you know, speaking out against the practice. And none of this was hardly even believable that it would happen even four years ago. And it's happening, we still have more work to do, um, but we've made a tremendous amount of progress. So this maybe just a couple questions, and I think our time is up. Um, if we come across clients who have been exposed to this or are being uh, asked to try this, should we try to contact you at the Southern Poverty Law Center? Yeah, us, our, our friends at the National Center for Lesbian Rights, um, Human Rights Campaign, others I think will be happy to talk to such individuals, but you can send them, you can send them our way and we're happy to, especially individuals with relatively recent experience, like within the last like four or five, six years, um, is especially um, of interest potentially. Any last question and then we should end. Thanks everyone for your attention and for listening. I appreciate it. I'm an attorney from a law firm called Tim Fulton Walker and Owen in Charlotte. Uh, we were uh, part of a legal team that won the, uh, the case in October 2014 that ended Amendment 1 and amended uh, and struck down the marriage laws in North Carolina related to that. Can you guys hear this? I don't feel like I'm. All right, we're better. Thanks. So again, my name's Luke Largest. I'm an attorney down in Charlotte. Um, I'm not going to talk today about the marriage case, marriage equality case, but sort of where we are now. And then I think the title is something like uh, "Religious Issues in Senate Bill Two, in particular." We have filed a lawsuit to challenge Senate Bill Two, which I'll explain. But I want to start with. Um, since a lot of you at the conference are not from North Carolina, sort of a bigger picture of where how these religious issues have been playing out, um, and then take you into what sort of the, the inside baseball, if you will, about sort of Senate Bill 2, how it developed and all this, it's kind of an interesting story. Um, uh, has everyone in this room, uh, just from news accounts, you've heard of RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, okay? The origins of RIFRA we're in this Supreme Court case in 1990, which was a couple of guys in Oregon who were members of, a, of an Indian tribe, used peyote in a religious ceremony, and then tested positively for the drug and lost their jobs. And then they applied for unemployment benefits. And this case went all the way up to the Supreme Court on whether their use of peyote for religious purposes would excuse them from Oregon's drug law against the use of peyote. Um, interesting Supreme Court opinion that up to that time, sort of these issues of how religion interacted with the state when there were sort of these competing interests was this thing called the Sherbert balancing test, not named after the ice cream, but after some other kind of, some another case involving actually unemployment as well. And the notion was that everyone had a compelling interest in their own religious beliefs, and it had to be balanced against what the state's interest was in a case. Well, this Smith decision sort of threw Sherbert out the window and said, when you're looking at a law like this that applies to everybody, a drug law, the, the way that you look at the religious, if we consider a compelling religious interest to give someone the right to be free from drug law, create sort of these problems. And, this, and there's a couple quotes here. This one, um, there's three, and, and, and there's a prize at the end if you can guess who wrote this line. The government's, I'm not going to read it so you can read it. The government's ability to enforce these laws can't be tied to sort of someone's spiritual development. They're laws of general act of ability. It would defy common sense and constitutional, basic constitutional principles. Whoops. Uh -oh. 
didn't say it right. Well, so let me tell you, this this is, the, and there's two slides missing here that I tried to add this morning, but let, let me explain what they were. So then the case goes through a laundry list of things that would be problems based on religious objections. The one most obvious is compulsory military service. This was back, well, actually, there wasn't a draft at this time, but during draft period. Even if you have religious objections to war, you still have to do some sort of alternative military service. Usually, it's, I mean, a non-military service, but a compulsory service. Environmental protection laws, animal cruelty laws, um, OSHA laws, minimum wage laws, a whole list of things in this opinion that would not apply if you used the Sherbert test and gave everyone a compelling interest to not follow a certain law because of their religious belief. And then there's this great line that says, to do that would be to court anarchy, particularly in a society where there's a, the larger the diversity of, of religious belief, the greater the problem of allowing every person to decide whether the law applies to them because of their religion. Well, this case kind of shook up the world, and an interesting, and I, it started RIFRA, which interestingly is three years later. The law we're going to get to is called Senate Bill 2, we call it SB2. I call this SB1 because it was strange bedfellows. This law, for those of you who remember, took three years to get passed because it was this strange coalition of very liberal people who wanted to protect the rights of Native Americans and sort of ritual things that would be covered by RIFRA, and the opposite end of the political spectrum that thought that this law, if passed, would give people a religious right to abortion because it was their religious belief that they should be able to have an abortion. So it took three years of wrangling in Congress to get language to RIFRA that the right wing found acceptable and the left wing found acceptable. And this was the basic notion of it, okay? It sort of puts this notion back in that there's a compelling interest and if the government, in your religious belief, and if the government is burdening that, you sort of, you can't, um, that the law's illegal. It was kind of a way of reasserting the Sherbert test on all the law of the land. Interestingly, it applied not just at the federal laws, but to state laws as well. And then, about four years later, a really interesting case sort of with this great, to me, great image, because it involves, literally involved a church on a hill. The city of Bern is a small city near San Antonio, about 20, 30 miles away. They have, you know, sort of the Alamo era style historical district, and they had this lovely, small Catholic church on a hill that was sort of that stucco style from the mission era. And the church was very popular, and they wanted to do a huge expansion. And the zoning people in the town would not let them do it because they were in this historic district and it was going to violate all the rules for building and make changes to buildings in the historic district. So the diocese, the Archbishop of Texas, sued that said it was a violation of his right to religious freedom to not be able to expand his church. And this went up to the Supreme Court and they decided that the RIFRA does not apply to the states. And it's a really interesting. For those of you who are here for CLE, you should read this opinion. It's fascinating sort of legal analysis that under the 14th Amendment, which was passed after the Civil War, to be able to enforce the rights of essentially of African-American citizens free from slavery, there was this enforcement clause, the fifth part of the 14th Amendment, which said that Congress could make laws to enforce the rights under the 14th Amendment. And that later was read to include all the rights in the Bill of Rights, including freedom of religion, and due process and all, all the things that are actually the first eight um, amendments to the Constitution. Um, and there's this really interesting analysis that under Byrd, they compared the RIFRA to the Voting Rights Act and said, look, in the Voting Rights Act, we had this huge problem of historical discrimination against large groups of people that we we're trying to remedy. That's the enforcement power of Congress. This is going after almost a non-existent problem. The issue of the government is not taking on religion systematically. There are times when the government makes decisions that impacts individuals' religious beliefs, but that's not part of the enforcement power. 
So RIFRA, in 1997, was declared not to apply to the states. It only applied to federal government. And actually, if you read that opinion, it's fairly interesting how the Hobby Lobby case from a year ago, which was a RIFRA case about sort of the federal regulations on contraception under the Affordable Care Act, were implicated the religious interests of this company that didn't want to have to pay for contraception. That was a RIFRA case, but if that case had been before the court in 1997, I think they would have said that RIFRA was unconstitutional as a federal law as well, when you read this opinion. And I am not familiar enough with all the briefing that went on in Hobby Lobby to see whether that issue, how that issue was resolved. But since that time, there, it, it, since 1997, so then you see these kind of curves. In 93, after RIFRA, there were two states that Rhode Island and Connecticut, Catholic states, adopted RIFRA, state RIFRAs. In 97, 98, and 99, a bunch of states, another 10 or 12, adopted state RIFRAs after Bernie. North Carolina was not one of them, but there were several. Uh, well, I'm sorry, here, but this is just the language, if you, which is out of proportion to the supposed violation they was trying to get. South Carolina in 99 passed their Religious Freedom Act. Alabama passed a constitutional amendment in 1998 that put religious, the Religious Freedom Amendment. Other states, and this is sort of in Florida in 99, then revised in 2014 and result of the marriage case issues. Texas, Virginia, and so you can see, the, and, then, and then as the, as this, sort of legal climate started to churn about marriage equality, you started seeing more of these, including Kentucky, Mississippi, and then famously Indiana last year after, after the Obergefell decision. North Carolina, last year, some of you may remember, there was a bill introduced, this House Bill 348, and um, it was defeated. There was a huge amount of controversy about it. And the Republicans decided to back off. Instead, they passed this Senate Bill 2, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute. But before, the sort of backdrop for drop to Senate Bill 2 is what I like to call the October Surprise. You all might remember when Reagan and Carter were, <laughs> and Reagan went and negotiated with the Iranians that he would, you know, they would get the hostages back after the election. The October Surprise. So there were five or six cases from the circuit courts, all before the Supreme Court in late September, early October, that everyone in the country thought was going to be, finally the Supreme Court was going to take up the marriage equality issue. But they were all favorable cases. There was no conflict, which is the way the Supreme Court generally doesn't take cases unless there's conflicts among the circuits. And so the October surprise was on the 3rd, I think it was the 3rd of October, the court announced, to the shock of the nation, really, that they weren't going to take any of these cases. And within a week, that we got, because of that ruling, the federal court in North Carolina that had our case pending ruled that under Bostick, which was the Virginia case, which had a very similar sort of structure to North Carolina, they had a constitutional amendment that banned same-sex marriage, and they had marriage laws that banned same-sex marriage. Those were struck down. And the judge ruled, well, there's no difference between Virginia and here. And we've got this rule on a Friday at 5 o'clock on my wedding anniversary, which was delightful. <laughs> Monday, John Smith, the director of the state court system, is run by something called the Administrative Office of the Courts. He sends out a letter to all magistrates saying, you know, you have to immediately start marrying same-sex couples, if they come before you, it's your constitutional duty. This is if they, if issued by the Register of Deeds. He doesn't have control over the Register of Deeds. He only has controls over judicial officials like magistrates. The next day, two things happen. This is kind of a big, uh, a big month. General counsel for the AOC issues a legal memo about the constitutional obligation of magistrates to marry same-sex couples. That same day, Judge Osteen in the Middle District, where there had been a marriage case pending for two years at that point, joins with Judge Cogburn here in Asheville and rules that Amendment 1 is unconstitutional. Yeah. 
This, the next day, uh, that same day, a third thing happens. Michael Kroll, who's a lawyer at Thurington Smith, is, does work for the North Carolina Institute of Government, which is this thing in Chapel Hill that does a lot of training for newly elected officials, everyone from fire chiefs to mayors to, you know, they sort of, but so they, he issues this thing to the district court judges. This is still on their website, the district court website, basically saying, look, we all thought there's a lot of difference of opinion about this marriage issue, but the difference for these magistrates is they took an oath of office, and they have an obligation to uphold that, and they need to understand that. And in that week, we don't know the exact number, but 30 to 60 of the magistrates in North Carolina resigned because they would not do the marriages. Senator Berger, I'm sure most of you are not from North Carolina, he's this sort of conservative who is um, the president, no, the this president pro tempore of the Senate um, has been kind of the leading charger on conservative issues. He and about another 20 senators wrote this letter to John Smith saying, you gotta make some religious accommodation for these magistrates. John Smith writes back on November 5th, and he says, look, I respect the religious beliefs of these magistrates, but they've made the moral decision by resigning, that if they can't uphold their oath of office, they have to resign their office. And there are a lot of people with sincerely held religious beliefs who don't think that civil marriage by a magistrate has anything to do with religion. It's a purely civil ceremony. Um, so, on January 28th, when the legislature reconvenes for the year, the long session, the odd years are long sessions in North Carolina, the even years are what we have now, a short session, which will start in April. Um, the second bill introduced, that's why this is called Senate Bill 2, the second bill introduced was this bill to allow magistrates and assistant and deputy registered needs to recuse themselves from marriage for sincerely held religious beliefs. And this is kind of the outline of it. For six month intervals, either the magistrates and these assistant registers of deeds could opt out of doing marriages, not just same sex marriages, but all marriages. And they sort of had done this analysis that if we're not gonna discriminate, we're just gonna say you have religious belief against marriage, um, but you can opt out of just marrying people. Um, there's no Application, I mean, there, you have to put in the notice, but there's no one to interview you to find out whether your belief is sincere, what your belief is. It's just, you just declare, I have a religious belief. And you get out of doing this. It also amended a criminal statute, which made it a misdemeanor for a magistrate not to perform a duty of office. An, an accepted marriage as a duty that they could decline to do and not be subject to removal from office or a misdemeanor charge. And then this is the key to the lawsuit. There's public spending. You guys are paying for this law. Two ways. The first is that if you get a county where all the magistrates refuse themselves, John Smith, the administrative officer of the court, has to pay to bring a magistrate from another county into that county to cover and do the marriages. We pay the mileage for that transition. Okay, the other way, the other public spending, and this is really galling, is that in anticipation that magistrates would be reappointed if they didn't have to do marriages, that if they got reappointed, they would get service credit for the time they were not working. And that we would use our tax money to pay both the employer and the employee share of the retirement contributions for these magistrates who don't want to uphold the Constitution. Then there's this sort of drama in the first six months or five months that you probably are familiar with, okay? They pass, the Senate passes the bill on February 28th. March 2nd, John Smith resigns from the AOC. You know, publicly, he has said, this has nothing to do with this law. In a very good sort of public servant, not wanting to kind of stir up a mess as he's leaving office. But it's pretty, you know, circumstantially, there might be some connection four days later, right? two days later. 
Marion Warren then becomes the head of the AOC, interim head of the AOC, appointed by Mark Martin, uh, the Republican Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in North Carolina. Um, he has not made public statements, but there's an assumption that he's very supportive of Senate Bill 2. The House then passes it on, on May 28th, the same day McCrory vetoes it. Um, and on June 11th, the legislature convenes and they override the veto. Then two weeks later, Obergefell passes. It's now the law of the nation, not just North Carolina. They are not moved. Here's McCrory's veto statement. Have prepared public statement. You, know, you take the oath. We are a nation of laws. If we disagree with the law, if you take an oath of office, you have to uphold the law. The local television station in Asheville opens the door to the legal challenge to Senate Bill 2 that we have met. Kim King, I don't know if you guys, people in Asheville can see her face on, the, on doing stuff. She was digging around and found out that all four magistrates in McDowell County had recused themselves. See, the bill was written in this kind of secret way. The decision to recuse was a personnel decision, and under the State Personnel Act, it had to be kept private. So you couldn't find out who had recused and who had not. You had to kind of go and watch who, who were doing the weddings and who were not, try to do it by deduction. But in McDowell, they all opted out. And someone from Rutherford County has been coming up. And we have, it. I, I'll show you the slide, but we have the monthly bills where the $24 per trip, you know, to go from, from Rutherford to to marry and to do the to do wedding, um, but the question was, how do we sue? And the and the and the issue, the problem, and the way this was written is that no one has been denied the right to marry. It was set up in a way to say we're not discriminating. We're going to make sure everyone who wants to marry can marry. So what's the legal claim? Well, it's something called taxpayer standing. It's very kind of arcane but fascinating doctrine, which goes back really to the 20s, this case called Frothingham. I don't know if that's something to do with the person's speaking style, but they, but a, a case saying that federal taxpayers, because the federal budget was so large, basically, federal taxpayers don't suffer any injury when there's some tax measure or some spending bill that they object to. Otherwise, you know, every time this Congress passed a law, someone could sue to challenge the law. So there's this limitation on what's called taxpayers bringing suits. But on the other hand, if you were in your town and you were a taxpayer in the municipality, you could sue because arguably you had more impact on you because it was a smaller budget and you'd have sort of more of a personal connection to it. Then in 1968, the first of a series of cases challenging public spending on religious schools was this flash case. I think it was seven people in New York City challenged the education appropriation that year, which had this, these um, grants to the states. And each state agency could then make grants from the federal money to the local school districts. And it allowed the grants to go to, to religious schools. And so these people in New York said, that violates the First Amendment. We can't use, you can't use my money to support religious schools. And the court agreed. And it's this kind of interesting doctrine that has been narrowed and challenged in a series of really interesting cases. But the, this is this, the Madison referred to here is James Madison, back from the, you know, the founding father. And there's this great, the establishment clause was designed as a specific bulwark against the potential government abuse of power of aiding or favoring some religion. That's at the root of who we are as a country. We don't do that. The cases evolve. This is the most recent one, in 2011. And, and let me take you just through a couple of them, because it was pretty fascinating, sort of the art. The thing about, about FLAS was that it was spending under Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, which is the spending clause. Okay. And so there was a series of cases of whether or not you could do anything other than a First Amendment challenge to a Section, to a section 8 spending. A couple of fascinating cases for those of you who were sort of 
in the Vietnam era. One was a case, these were both like in 1974, I think, right at the end of Vietnam. One was a case to challenge the CIA to force it to, to publish a public budget. And the court said, well, you don't have standing for that, because that's not Article 8 spending. That's you know, sort of another issue. You're really just challenging the CIA charter. You don't have any standing to do that. And another one, um, named after Schlesinger, who was the Secretary of State at the time, um, the president, I think, I, I think Nixon, had um, issued an executive order sort of in kind of response to the anti-militarism that was kind of percolating in the country at that time to allow Congress people to join the reserves. And there was this challenge that, well, you can't, as a congressman, hold a separate office. You, know, you can't be a military officer and a congressman at the same time. And say, well, that's not a spending challenge. And it kind of went up. You might remember under George W. Bush, there was this thing called the faith-based initiatives that he had. And there was a challenge to that. How can we be spending public money on su supporting these church groups? And I said, well, it actually isn't Congress doing it under Section 8. It's, they've, given some, uh, they've given some executive appropriation to Bush, and he's just using the money. You can't challenge that. Um, but then there was this case, interesting, along sort of this notion of, uh, of vouchers and public support for private and religious schools. Arizona has this program called school, STO. is a school tuition organization. And you can donate up to $500 at tax time to an STO that then gets used to give tuition grants to students who want to go to religious schools. And this was a 5-4 split. It's one of these culture war cases that are fascinating to read because it involved like $50 million a year of, of public money going to these religious schools. And the major conservative majority says, well, but it's not spending, it's a tax credit. And they said, and besides, it's not the amount of money, it's the spending. And they sort of take this language from Flash about the Madisonian prohibition. It's not the amount of property. If it's only three pence, if it's for religious purposes, it's a violation. So we're challenging Senate Bill 2 because it's three pence for religious purposes. A couple things here. Magistrates in North Carolina are judges. They're judicial officers. They take this judicial oath of office. And they can be removed under the same rules that apply to other kinds of judges. And they perform a long list. I'm going to just put these up here, but you can go, this is out of the statute, of judicial functions. They take cr some criminal pleas, handle misdemeanor matters, they take depositions, they issue subpoenas, they enter judgments, they issue arrest warrants and search warrants, they set bail, um, they can take cases on worthless checks that are less than $2,000, and then they perform marriage ceremonies. It's one of their judicial duties. The judicial oath of office was established in 1789 as a requirement of Article 6 of the Constitution that North Carolina amended, adopted. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. North Carolina has had several kind of constitutions. They've rewritten it several times. Uh, one in 1868, for obvious reasons, after a minor war that some of you may have heard of. And then, uh, in 1970, there was a massive rewrite again. And each of those constitutions had language like this. In, in the 1970 Constitution, the oath of office is part of the Constitution. It's not sort of a reference to a statute. It's part of the Constitution. I solemnly swear to support and maintain the Constitution of the United States. Every magistrate swears to that. And there's a statute with the same thing that sets out oath of offices for all public officials. And this is not just magistrates, but everybody who's a public officer in North Carolina has to swear to support the Constitution of the United States and to uphold North Carolina laws that are not inconsistent with the Constitution of the United States. So we have a First Amendment claim that the use of this public money to further this statutory right to renounce on religious grounds um, marriage equality is the use of public money to support a religious view. 
And that violates the First Amendment. And then there's these other cases, sort of these balancing tests that still exist under something called the Lemon Test. Again, maybe Lemon and Sherbert go together. <laughs> but this, you know, it violates all its primary purpose, its sole purpose is religious. And it endorses a single religious belief, even though it's not on the face of it, but the only reason it's there is for people who object to marriage equality. It entangles the state in a religious issue. And this last thing, which leads to two other claims, is it compromises the judicial system. You are allowing people to remain as judges who are not willing to uphold the oath of office. So we've added these equal protection claims that it fosters discrimination against lesbian and gay couples, um, particularly in a county like McDowell. Not, not because you can't get married, but now you know that in McDowell County, if you have to go to a poor magistrate for any of these long laundry list of issues that you might have to go before a magistrate for, even if you're trying to pursue some remedy against somebody who's done you wrong or whether you are accused of doing wrong, you're going to be in front of four people who think you are not a full citizen of this country. And that is a, we think, an equal protection problem. Whether we have standing to bring that problem will be to bring that case the issue is is kind of a difficult part of this case. I'm not sure how that's going to be resolved. Um, and then the whole issue here again: the recusals are private. We you don't so you know it, you're allowed as a citizen if you know that a judge has a conflict of interest in your case. There was a famous one in Charlotte a few years back where a district court judge who heard family court matters. A lot of the, uh, several of the family court lawyers that came before him, they all owned a house together in the mountains. <laughs> and he had not disclosed it. He just didn't think, you know, it was like, you know, yeah, we own a house and we share it. And we have, I get the third week of June, you know, that kind of thing. Boy, he got taken before the judicial standards. I mean, it was a big issue. But you can't know whether the person that you're going in front of as a magistrate, what their position is on this constitutional question. So you don't have a right to seek recusal. And then sort of the same arguments kind of again for due process. Um, there's a potential that this case is gonna become a circus. The state is represented by um, the Attorney General, which is awkward because he's running, saying that he thinks these laws are dumb. Um, or, or it, it puts it more profoundly than that, but that's basically what it is. <laughs> and so Phil Berger and Moore, Moore is the Speaker of the House, Berger's the President of the Senate, they want to get in and they have filed this brief saying, he doesn't believe in these laws, we need to defend them. And then Bumgarner, who's a magistrate in Allegheny, no, Alexander County, um, is represented by the same law firm that represented Ms. Kim Davis. Um, some of you probably have heard the Kentucky Register of Deeds who refused to allow or issue licenses in her office. And then there are these three others, Holland, Myrick, and Dill. And we know that Holland, who's from Graham County, is one of the people who got his retirement contribution because he took six months off and now he's back in. Um, and we only know that because he filed a lawsuit against the AOC for having to resign his job, saying it would violate his right to religious freedom. And his lawyers from that, that lawsuit was dismissed, and it's on appeal to Court of Appeals. And now Ellis Winter, um, no, no, Ellis Boyle um, is representing that, representing them in that other case, is also representing them in, in this case. So, and, and, and then we got into this, I'll, I'll tell you sort of a little story here. That there's kind of, that since, since we have it, I think we have the time, just to, um, I know, we're doing great. We've got another 25 minutes. Um, we filed this case originally against the state of North Carolina. You would think that it makes sense. You think the state's violating your federal rights, you sue the state. Um, and there's this doctrine called the 11th Amendment that says that citizens of a one state cannot sue another state in federal court, and foreign citizens can't sue in federal court. But it doesn't say that citizens of a state can sue their state in federal court. So we sued in federal court, but there's this doctrine that's developed that the state is not a person 
Corporations are persons, but the state is not a person for purposes of, of what's called 1983 litigation, which is a statute, post-Civil War statute, that allowed people to challenge individuals violating their constitutional rights. So the state is not an individual or a person. So the state wouldn't raise that defense. They can waive that immunity. They can agree to be sued. And since we're not seeking money, we're just seeking an injunction. We thought we could do it this way, but they objected. So then we said, well, we're going to name Marion Warren, which is what you have to do. It's kind of this legal fiction. You can't sue the state, so you sue the state official in his official capacity, which is a claim against the state. Um, but it's recognized because he's a person under 1983, or she, or whoever you're suing. So we have refiled the lawsuit. They wouldn't consent to us stipulating that we'll just substitute Marion Warren for the state and continue on. So we dismissed the lawsuit a couple, two weeks ago, refiled it against Marion Warren. All these same people have moved to intervene. We're still waiting on the state's answer. And it'll be, and, and of course, and, you know, the interesting question in these cases is what, what's your right to intervene when you're trying to defend a statute that the state's also trying to defend? And there's actually a pretty good case law. I think that none of them are going to be able to intervene. I might, you know, I might be wrong, but you basically have to show that the state's representation is inadequate. And in all the, they all file motions to dismiss our case when, when we filed it in December against the state. They all filed it and they all raised the same ground. They all said 11th Amendment immunity. They all said you don't have standing, taxpayer standing. And they all said and you haven't stated a claim. So they all raised the same argument. So we had this brief ready to say, you know, if they're making the same argument, that, that shows that the state's argument is adequate. So they don't have any place in this case. But we haven't filed that yet. We're getting ready to refile it. Um, and so, 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 so that's where we are. And I, I'm happy to answer questions, or you can go out and enjoy the sun on this beautiful view. Thank you. Oh, no, no, no.